Hello, I'm Justin Hamlin, an undergraduate student currently researching at the Michigan State University College of Engineering under Dr. Caroline Chapansky. And today I'm going to be discussing the solubility of chemicals in organic solvent with a focus on Hansen solubility parameters. So more specifically, I'm going to explain the process of how we can determine the solubility sphere of a specific chemical through solubility testing. So what exactly are Hansen solubility parameters? Well, put quite simply, it is a quantitative system created by Hansen that can predict the miscibility of two or more species. This system breaks the cohesive energy density into three parts, accounting for dispersive, polar, and H-bond forces. And we can see the derivation of those three numbers in the two equations below. Um, it's the cohesive energy density divided by the molar volume. So once we determine the HSP values of a particular species, we list those values in coordinate form, and that tells us the, the specific dispersive, polar, and H-bond values, respectively, for that species. Now, these values can only be determined experimentally through solubility tests, which I will discuss more in detail later. However, once these HSP values are known, they can be compared to other species in order to predict the miscibility between two species. As a general rule of thumb, chemicals with similar HSP values are miscible, whereas chemicals with largely different HSP values are immiscible. So that brings up this question of how do we know which HSP values are similar enough to be miscible and which HSP values are so largely different that they are immiscible? To answer this question, Hansen presented a sphere model plotted in HSP space to represent the entire solubility of a species. In this model, the RA value of a solvent gives the distance in HSP space between that solvent and the species in question. And we can see the equation to determine that RA value in the equation below. The RO value gives the radius of the sphere of that species. The relative energy distance, or red, is defined as RA divided by RO. In an optimal HSP model, all bad solvents will lay outside of the sphere and consequently will have a red greater than one, and all good solvents will lay inside of the sphere with a red less than one. This sphere model allows a distinctive line to be drawn in which species on one side are soluble and species on the other side are insoluble. So now I'm going to talk about the methodology of the system and how we can actually determine the HSV sphere of a species through experimental observation. So for the materials of this lab, we have taken monolaurin powder as a model chemical for HSP investigation. However, other chemicals can be used in place of our species and the methodology will likely be identical. You will also need MATLAB and Excel and various pure solvents. When you are selecting solvents for this experiment, you want to use solvents that encompass a wide range of HSP values. For example, you want a range of solvents of high dispersive values and low dispersive values, high polar and low polar, high H bond and low H bond. As a reference, the solvents listed here encompass a relatively wide range of HSP values. To find the HSP values of common solvents, the Hansen solubility parameters user's handbook is often helpful. For the solubility tests, this is where we determine which solvents are good and which solvents are bad for the species in question. 0.1 grams of dry monolaurin powder was added to enough solvent to make the total weight of the nanoparticle and the solvent, or of the chemical and the solvent, 10 grams. This was in order to create a one weight percent monolaurin solution. This mixture was then stirred vigorously for 30 seconds and then sonicated for 30 seconds. This process was repeated for each solvent and then the samples sat undisturbed until the sedimentation time had passed for that solvent. The, relative, or the sedimentation time corresponds to the duration of time over which a species will form a precipitate in bad solvent. And we can see the equation to get the T said value below. I've also listed the solvent sedimentation times for this particular study to the right. Note that the sedimentation time will change depending on the chemical density and solvent properties. So once the sedimentation time for each solvent has passed, all dispersions were placed in front of text and observed. A ranking of two corresponding to a good solvent was uh, given to dispersions in which the text could be read well. A ranking of one for partial solvents was given to dispersions that were, you, that were partially turbid um, and had minimal precipitation. And a ranking of zero for bad, so, for bad solvents exhibited extremely turbid and or excessive precipitation. So after giving each solvent a solubility ranking corresponding to the chemical in question, 
These values were placed in an Excel sheet along with the name and HSP values of the corresponding solvent or solvent mixture. Again, the HSP values were determined using the second edition of Hansen Solubility Parameters User's Handbook by Charles M. Hansen. So once a rough sphere is determined for a species, solvent mixtures are often used to test the limits of the sphere and squeeze the sphere into the optimal radius. If solvent mixtures were used, the combined HSP value for the mixture was determined as the sum of the product of the dispersive values and the mass ratio. <clears throat> This equation also applies to polar and H-bond values as well. Here we can see what our Excel spreadsheet looks like once all of the data is plugged in. I place the name of each solvent along with the delta D, delta P, and delta H values and solubility ranking for each individual solvent. So in some cases, as with monolaurin, we may find that running the MATLAB algorithm with all of this data this entire data set combined, gets us a sphere with a very low data fit, uh, which basically means that some solvents lay inside, some bad solvents lay inside of the sphere, and some good solvents lay outside of the sphere. And I will discuss this data fit later. So if this happens to you where you get a really bad data fit, I recommend looking at the structure of the molecule that you're studying, because there is a chance that it has two areas of different polarities. For example, the monolaurin molecule has a nonpolar tail, um, and a polar hydroxylic head. So therefore, from this structure, I would expect to see two different areas of interaction with both polar and nonpolar molecules. So therefore, I split up the data into two tables with high H-bond values and low H-bond values. And usually you will see um, kind of a split of data um, between the two values, uh, or between the two hydrogen values um, in the sets of data. And so I did include um, all of the bad solvents in both sets of data, as no matter what, um, the bad solvents have to lay outside of both spheres. And so splitting up these two spheres, um, I instead got a, I instead got two spheres of great fit for the monolaurin molecule. So in some cases, um, chemicals can have two solubility spheres rather than just one. So next, we will take this Excel data and plug it into a MATLAB algorithm in order to calculate the HSP sphere for the nanoparticle in question. In the case of monolaurin, partial solvents were considered good because these partial solvents fit into the calculated sphere quite well, as with other good solvents. However, in some cases, you may want to ignore partial solvents and simply not include it in the MATLAB calculation. It all depends on your preference and how largely these different rankings affect the sphere. For this study, we used a slightly altered version of the Garagizi algorithm. And in short, this algorithm is designed to create a HSP sphere with all bad solvents inside and all good solvents inside. When I initially used this algorithm, it took hours to get an output if the data fit or the goodness of the sphere was less than one. So I altered it slightly to make this output much quicker. So here's a flowchart that represents the Garagizi algorithm. So uh, this first step, First, it takes, the algorithm takes a guess value of the delta D, delta P, delta H um, values, and it takes that value as the average of all the HSP values entered into the algorithm. So this is its starting point. So next, it undergoes an optimization function to maximize the data fit of the sphere, or again, the goodness of the fit of the sphere. This function keeps repeating multiple times, altering both the radius and the center point of the sphere, and follows this following pattern. If the RA of a solvent is greater than RO, or if the red is greater than 1, the solubility for that solvent should be 0. If a, <clears throat> a value of, if the, solvent, if, um, if the solvent ranking is indeed 0, then a value of 1 is outputted here. If the solubility value is not 0, if it's 1 or 2, then a penalty value is created of e to the power of the difference of the RA and the RO. Similarly, if the RA is less than 1, or if the red is less than 1, um, the solubility should be equal to 1 for that run. If the solvent is good, then no penalty is taken. If this is not true, the same penalty is taken as e to the power of diff the difference between RA and RO. And so at the end, a data fit value is calculated, which is the product of all penalty values to the power of 1 divided by the number of solvents. If no penalties are taken, then a data fit of one is output. However, if penalties for that run exist, then the data fit will be less than one. 
The algorithm will repeat this process thousands of times while slightly altering the HSP and RO values for the steer. Out of all the runs, the run with the data fit value closest to one is taken as the output, and the HSP and RO values for that run are displayed. So these are um, basically the main steps that I take when I use um, MATLAB. <clears throat> so I open the solvent database matrix. Um, I will delete about half of the current data in the matrix, um, just in case the data that I'm importing is um, has fewer solvents than the current data in that matrix. Um, and then I copy and paste the delta D, delta P, delta H values and the solubility ranking into the matrix for each solvent. Um, and then I type save solvent database data, and this just makes sure that the algorithm can actually use um, this new matrix that I just altered. So now that the solvent data is saved onto MATLAB, there are two different optimization functions to choose from. One is hsp.m, and that is the default HSP optimization from Garagizi. However, this has no bounds. And so some data sets with a data fit less than one will be huge, like with a radius of 50, um, or they will have negative HSP values, which you don't want. And so I created a slightly altered version, um, which I call bound.m, which um, it uses a very similar um, penalty um, optimization. However, it does have bounds so that the solubility sphere is not large or negative. And it's also much quicker than the HSP algorithm. So in most cases, these two values are exactly the same that I get from HSP and bound. However, I often run both functions and use my judgment to choose between the two if they are slightly different. So now I'm going to pull up MATLAB and just show you um, how these different algorithms work. So first, this whole section here, um, it just takes all of the inputted values, um, delta D, delta P, delta H, and it finds the average of all of that. And, uh, it stores that average as guess. And so then um, it undergoes its optimization function right here. So originally, this with the Garagizi algorithm, this was a while function. However, I changed it to a four um, just so there's kind of a numerical end to it rather than just running countless, um, countless times. Um, because with the while function, it would take hours to come out with um, an output if the data fit was less than one. So um, while this is running, it calls upon the QF function. And so in here, we can see basically what I explained in the flowchart. Um, it takes the current um, guess values for that run. And then if RA is greater than RO, then the solubility should be equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, then there's an output of one. If it's not equal to zero, then there is a penalty value. If RA is less than RO, then the solubility should be equal to one. So if the solubility is equal to zero, then a penalty value is taken. And if it's not equal to zero, then the output is one. So here, this is the data fit function. Um, <clears throat> and so this optimization function keeps repeating and repeating until it gets uh, the data fit that is closest to one. And so then after this um, finishes and the run with the data fit closest to one is found, um, the delta D, delta P, delta H values and the radius of the sphere are also outputted. And so also this um, algorithm displays the, so the relative energy distance between the calculated sphere and the solvents that were input in. So similarly, this is my bound um, algorithm. And so this is basically the only difference it is just a different optimization function. Um, but here it has a limit of 25 for each of the values. And I find that that just kind of, um, that's enough to make it into a more relatively sized sphere um, that has not negative values and not huge radii. <clears throat> so now I'm just going to show you how I run this. So click solvent database and open up data. And so normally if I were starting um, a brand new uh, data set, I would highlight about half of them, uh, right click and click delete row. However, I'm not going to do that just because then I would have to import new data. So after I input this new data, um, I would type save solvent database data, click enter, and then wait a few seconds for it to update. And then after I do this, I can uh, type HSP and that will run the HSP um, 
HSP algorithm. And so it obviously takes a minute for this um, algorithm to actually go through. So I will come back when we get a result. All right, so we just got our um, output for this specific data set. And this is, um, this is from the polar sphere of Mandalore. And so we can see that the data fit is equal to one. We got um, a delta D value of 26.9, delta P of 6.2, delta H of 40.53, and a radius of 35. So obviously, uh, something's a little off here. Normal, normally, the radii are anywhere from 6 to 13. Um, and so this is partially why I created the bound algorithm, just because um, this way, when we run it with the bound, with bound zone on, it will create more relatively sized spheres. But as we can see here, uh, the red values are also displayed, and uh, all values with a solubility of one or two, um, the relative energy distance is less than one, and all species with a solubility of zero, the red is greater than one. So now I'm going to run the bound algorithm. And it, uh, it's taking a few seconds, but it's a lot quicker than the HSP algorithm. And so we can see uh, we have a lot better size um, outputs right here. The radius is 9.1 rather than 30 or 40 as it was before. Um, and then similarly, we also get relative energy distances here. Um, and the data fit is one, so that means that solubility is of one or two, the relative energy distance is less than one, and solubility is of zero, the relative energy distance is greater than one. Um, and so that is just how you use the MATLAB algorithm. Just a little background. All right, so finally, graphing the spheres is also a very important part of showing results to the public. So for this study, we used Origin Pro, Origin Pro to graph the spheres, and I'll show you how to graph the spheres right now. So pull up your Origin Pro um, app. Uh, this is just started for me. And then you click File, New, Function Plot, and 3D Parametric Function Plot. And then I already have a um, HSP sphere parametric function plot kind of saved, but really you just need four values, R and the X, um, X, Y, and Z, and X corresponds to dis dispersive, Y corresponds to polar, and Z corresponds to H bond. And so for each value, X, Y, and Z, um, you just multiply each by R, and then for X, you add X to the end, for Y, you add Y to the end, and for Z, you add Z to the end. So for this particular data set, let's say we have a radius of nine, dispersive value of 15, polar value of 10, and hy hydrogen bond value of 17. And we just click OK. <clears throat> and that creates a matrix. You can just kind of ignore that, put that off to the side, and we get a fancy little graph here, little sphere. And so what we do, um, sometimes you will actually find that it creates a shape kind of like this, a weird integral shape. So in this case, all you have to do is double click the integral, go to surface, and then uh, check the parametric surface box set x matrix to matrix two and y matrix to matrix three and just click OK. And then that creates a sphere. And so um, sometimes, especially when I'm filling good solvents and bad solvents around the sphere, I find that it's best to make the sphere transparent. So what I'll do is I'll disable the mesh function. And then um, instead of auto transparency, I will set it to about 80, 80 to 90%. And then we can see here that it's more transparent, so you can actually see through it. So if there was a good solvent inside of the sphere, we would be able to see that in this graph. <clears throat> and so here, um, if these spheres were if these spheres were not transparent, um, then the green circles, which represent good solvents inside of the spheres, they would not be visible. And obviously, this specific graph wouldn't really be able to display what it should be displaying, which is that good solvents lay inside the spheres and bad solvents lay outside of the spheres. Now, one note while using this graphing software is that sometimes bad solvents with a red very close to one that closely border the sphere will appear inside of your graph sphere. Uh, for example, this red square right here, it almost appears like it's just inside of that sphere. 
And this is simply because of the coefficient of four and that RA equation that we saw before. So in reality, due to directional forces, the solubility sphere of most species should be should really be represented as a solubility epsiloid um, because some polar forces and some H-bond forces are directional and therefore they would partially be canceled out. However, for simplicity, we can just address these irregularities if any appear in our papers and we can safely ignore them um, as this is simply just a representation of the numbers that we have um, that we have concluded from our MATLAB algorithm. All right, so that concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed, and now you can go on and calculate and graph these solubility spheres for yourself, and thank you for watching.